Yeah, so my first question, Claude, um, before we kind of dive into the book, I just wanted to kind of ask you about your um, your distinguished career, uh, you know, spanning over 50 years in philosophy. Um, you know, you've lived a life immersed in philosophy. So I just wanted to kind of ask first, you know, how did you get into philosophy? You know, what initially attracted you to it? Um, and then kind of when you decided to pursue it, uh, I mean, one thing I think is interesting is that some people, you know, have to fight back allegations of being impractical. So I'm just kind of curious if, if, you, if you were in a supportive um, environment. And then also, I just want to know, um, how did you decide to specifically focus on William of Ockham, um, who obviously is a medieval philosopher, so he died, you know, over, you know, nearly 700 years ago. Um, and then, and then the kind of final aspect of that is just like, you really have a strong command of analytic philosophy. So I'm kind of curious why you didn't choose to just, you know, go that route because, you know, when you're, um, his, when you're focusing all, also on a historical figure, it's like adds extra burdens, <laughs> you know, so you have to get the philosophy right. And then you also have to do all this historical stuff. So I'm just, yeah. So I'm just curious in short, you know, how did you get into philosophy? Why Occam? And then how did, uh, why not just, you know, pure analytic philosophy? So, <laughs> well, thanks for these, uh, these questions. Uh, when I was a student at, at college, uh, that was in, a, in Montreal, like in Quebec province. And this is the French part of, uh, of Canada. And my, my mother tongue is, is French. Uh, so when I finish, was finishing college, that was in the early 60s, long time ago. And uh, this was a very exciting time in Quebec. The, the, old, the whole society was changing. Uh, Quebec was moving from a rural, a very strictly Catholic society uh, to a more modern, open, uh, and, it, and it was moving uh, very fast. This is what we call, we, it has been called at the time, and it's still called the quiet revolution. So things were really changing. Uh, the educational system, health system, um, well, the whole society was changing pretty quickly, and we were very aware people of my age were very aware of that and we were aware that we had to you know rethink so to say the the whole thing you know and, and not only the social organization we had to rethink the social organization but not only that but foundations of it so uh that was what attracted me to philosophy first and then and also when I studied it at college, I I really liked it. I mean, the, the rigor of it, you know, trying to understand with uh, pre precision and arguments, uh, rationality. Uh, this is something that uh, was uh, attractive to me. Uh, and yes, there was some reluctance from from my family. My my yes, my father was a doctor, and he had always hoped that I would take over his his uh, cabinet. Uh, uh, and, and become a doctor as well. So we had, let's say, uh, intense discussions uh, yeah. dur during uh, one year, uh, basically. And then uh, he consulted his uh, older brother, uh, whom I was playing chess with some, from time to time, and his older brother told him, well, let him do what he wants, and then uh, <laughs> we'll see what whatever happens. So we followed his brother's advice, and then that was settled, and uh, my father was okay with uh, with my with my choice. And uh, then I, I went to the University of Montreal. Uh, the training there was mostly continental philosophy. <clears throat> uh, I did an MA dissertation on Merleau-Ponty, okay. actually. And when I was through that, I it was clear to me that I would keep going on uh, to the PhD. And I was interested in philosophy of language, uh, mostly, and 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 uh, ontology. Um, but I learned that uh, uh, there was uh, at the time at the University of Montreal there was a wonderful Institute of Medieval Studies. Uh, it was a small uh, institute, but with good budget, uh, good faculty members, and they had the budget to invite, uh, you know, some of the best. Uh, European, mostly French, uh, 
experts in, in medieval philosophy. And I learned that I could do a second MA uh, in medieval studies there in one year, having already done MA philosophy. So I thought, well, okay, I know virtually nothing about Middle Ages. It's a, you know, thousand year period. Uh, so I should know something about it and it will give me some uh, historical method too. So I thought, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. I'll do a year in medieval and then I'll, you know, come back to serious business and, and, and uh, contemporary philosophy. Uh, but then I, I had to do a dissertation. That was the, the system, you know, 100 or 120, 30, uh, 130 page dissertation on, on something. And since I had this interest in uh, philosophy of language, uh, I, I went to uh, a faculty member that I, whom I knew personally, and I asked him, uh, were there you know, people, philosophers who were interested in language in the Middle Ages? And I you know, vividly remember uh, his answer. He said, yes, uh, there were the novelists. Okay, I said, who were they? And he said, well, basically there were two, two of them. Uh, Peter Abelard in the 12th century and William of Ockham in the 14th century. I said, okay, the, the last one you mentioned, I'll look into that. And I went to read about Ockham. Uh, I especially remember reading the um, Copel, the chapter in the uh, Copleston History of Philosophy on Ockham's long chapter. And I thought, wow, that's something. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll do it, you know, a dissertation, 100 page on this author uh, and his conception of language in, in, the, uh, the, in the sum of logic, the summa logicae. And uh, well, well, for one thing, it took me two years instead of one because that was more uh, word than I had uh, expected. And then when I finished that, I, you know, I had the feeling that I only scratched the surface of it. So I thought, yeah, okay, uh, I'll do a PhD on that. Uh, it, it will take me three years, basically. So, and then I'll come back to uh, uh, contemporary philosophy. Uh, uh, but that was, you know, I was wrong. It, it took me, I think, eight or nine years to finish that PhD. And in the meanwhile, I started teaching, so I'm in courses to prepare. And also, uh, I went uh, into, uh, an, I discovered analytic philosophy, which I was and I, I had not been trained into while the student at the University of Montreal. Um, and I started reading it in, in this field and uh, had, yes, uh, that's the way it should be done. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, but I realized that I had a lot of work to do uh, to get into that. You know, so I trained myself by myself in, in formal logic and went to Frege and Russell and Wittgenstein and Carnap. And you know, and more recent authors, Kripke, and yeah. so so for a number of years, I was basically reading that stuff uh, with very great interest. And for a while, uh, these were two parallel things. I was working on my uh, dissertation on Occam and uh, teaching, <clears throat> and also and and uh, getting myself in to know something uh, analytic philosophy. But the more I was reading, uh, okay, excuse me, uh, okay, but the more I was reading, uh, it, it would come naturally that I would make relations. You know, I was reading, let's say, Kripke, and I thinking, well, or Russell, I was thinking, well, Occam has interesting things to say about that. And uh, so, and then I would go back to Occam and uh, read him with contemporary questions in mind, would he have, is there something there about what Russell is discussing, about what Kripke is discussing? Uh, yes, there is. So, you know, I, I found that this connection was uh, extremely interesting. So when I finished my PhD, I finished, finally finished it in 78, I think, uh, on, on Occam, um, I, uh, for a while I hesitated. Should I, you know, drop medieval philosophy completely? Uh, but I that would be a pity since, you know, I spent so much time working on that mm -hmm. and I got some, you know, confidence on in it. And, and there's this aspect, which is fascinating of putting these two worlds in, in connection. At first I thought that there was 
kind of a, a rupture, a severe break between the two. But mm. uh, as I as I went reading, I, I realized that the discussion was possible, and and I realized that I had some, you know, I had the training in both, so I I could contribute something, maybe something special to this uh, sort of, of of exchange between uh, medieval, especially. Uh, Occam, of course, and especially 14, uh, early 14th century, let's say the first half of the 14th century, uh, philosophy was, you know, it was an outic philosophy, basically, where, you know, based on arguments uh, with a lot of place given to semantics and logic. So this, this those are the distinctive features of, of an outic philosophy. So it was a medieval kind of an outic philosophy. And, and so I thought I, maybe I can contribute something uh, to to an, this exchange. That's and and well, here I am, uh, basically fifty or sixty years later, and still doing that. That's great. Thank you very much. It's really yeah, it's really interesting to hear that journey. And and uh, and, and in this book, you definitely yeah, you 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 do that exchange between medieval and analytic without forcing it which is really um it's just it comes it, it goes really naturally um great and so maybe then we can kind of dive into the book itself um and perhaps we could begin by um <laughs> yes exactly yes <laughs> yeah Occam's Omelism. and um maybe we could begin by just could you provide just a kind of initial description of Occam's philosophical system i'm thinking specifically you highlight um three central alchemist theses and and you know we'll delve deeply more more deeply into them in subsequent questions but if you could kind of give an initial uh sketch of that uh that would be that would be great yes well very briefly uh alchemist view of the world is uh of a, a world of individuals to take a phrase from Nelson Goodman. Uh, and uh, this, an aspect I don't insist on in the book, but which was important for Rockham, is the theological aspect of it. Uh, he was very concerned uh, to preserve God's omnipotency. And uh, he thought that accepting universals like, you know, Platonic, Platonic forms uh, out there would. Uh, unduly limit God's omnipotence because uh, God, uh, Plato thought that they would be uh, eternal. Uh, and even if they're not eternal, uh, why would God have to go through this to create the world? So his view of the world is there's a God and this this is an individual being, very special individual being, uh, but an individual being nevertheless. And uh, the rest are all singular individual beings as well created by this uh, all-powerful God. Uh, and uh, everything goes in between, everything that happens goes in between all these singular uh, individual beings. That there's a, uh, a valuation of individuality, so to say, that, that mm. comes out there. Uh, so the, the, the three theses that I identified as being what I call Occam's nominalism. He didn't use that label. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the three theses are, first, there are no universals out there in the world. There are universals, but not out there. There, there are signs either in the mind or in language. Uh, second thesis, there are no relations uh, out there in the world as uh, extra as additional entities um, in addition to uh, the relata. Um, relational terms are special, uh, but uh, they're special in the way that they refer to things that are not intrinsically relational. And uh, third thesis about quantity. Uh, this is a bit different because uh, Occam admits that there are quantities out there in the world, but they're not different from substances and from singular substances and singular uh, qualities. Uh, in, in his view, the only singular 
kinds of the only kinds of singular beings that have reality are substances and qualities such as colors or weight. Uh, so it can be truly said that a substance is a quantity insofar as it has parts outside of parts, it's extended. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is a quantity, but the quantity in it is not an, ex an additional uh, being. Mm -hmm. Qualities are additional beings, and the color of a thing for Occam is um, an additional being, something distinct from the substance which has this color, but not so for quantity. So those are the three theses that I uh, constructed the book around. Great. And maybe now we can kind of look especially at the first thesis. Like, like I said, I kind of, we're hoping today to kind of focus on his nominalism about universals. So that pertains to the first thesis, like you said, he doesn't think there are any universals um, out there in the world. And and as and you kind of put it this way that Occam takes universality or generality to be not an ontological feature, but instead um, a feature of semantics or the meaning of linguistic terms. And so kind of before we dive into his reasoning for that thesis, you know, his arguments for it, um, you know, could you just kind of give us a sense of what, what does it mean to take generality to be a feature of semantics and not ontology? And then um, it might be useful to kind of just maybe we could, you know, briefly also discuss how that puts him at odds with certain central um, medieval philosophers like Aquinas and Scotus. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the standard sense of uh, from universal, what it was to be a universal in, in the Middle Ages is that it was to be predicable of many. Uh, you know, like, uh, I don't know, white is predicable, predicable of many things because many things are white and uh, human beings is predicable of many because there are several uh, individual beings that are human beings. Uh, Occam's reasoning is that, and Abelard uh, had the same reasoning too, is that, uh, well, being predicable is a feature of science. Uh, it, it is science that are predicable, not, not real things out there. Uh, so the generality is a feature of science insofar as certain signs refer to several singular things at once. You know, like uh, human being, the, the, the term, human, the phrase human being uh, is general or universal uh, in the sense that it simultaneously refers to several, large number actually, of uh, singular um, entities, singular beings. And same is uh, for a term like white. Uh, it refers to all the things that are white in the world. And there are quite a lot of, of such things. So saying that uh, universality is a feature of science is saying that only science can have this feature of referring to several things at once. So that's the, uh, the, the, the basic idea and that uh, there's no generality in the things themselves, just how we refer to them. Mm -hmm. uh, this does not mean, however, let me insist on this, that uh, we're wrong uh, in, in using these uh, general terms. Um, this this corresponds to our use of general terms is justified um, in so far as the things that are referred to by a certain term, certain general term, uh, really resemble each other in, in some way or, or other. Uh, so it's not, you know, Occam is not a nominalist in the sense that uh, someone like Nelson Goodman is, who thinks that uh, 
well, we basically construct the, the world with our language. And uh, we have a lot of uh, flexibility in doing that. We, uh, we speak of, Goodman speaks of world making uh, with the language. It's a sort of linguistic idealism. Uh, this is not at all what Ockham thought. Ockham thought that, yes, we all are really human beings. And mm -hmm. we all uh, essentially uh, resemble each other. Uh, so the use of a, of a label that applies to human beings and only human beings is not something artificial. It is, it is grounded in reality. But there is no need for a universal, a special universal thing to ground uh, this. Now, how uh, did this uh, uh, place him with respect to some other? First of all, it must be said that uh, Ockham thought of himself as a almost orthodox Aristotelian. Mm. Uh, he, he, uh, argues in great length uh, all across his, wor his works, say, well, this thesis about universal, thesis about relations, thesis about quantity, this is what Aristotle says, basically. And sometimes, about, especially about quantity, because he has some, you know, theological problems or suspicions uh, of, the, of the theological consequence of what he yelled about quantity, he would sometimes say, well, uh, I'm, I'm just reciting the thesis here. I'm just saying what Aristotle thought, mm. uh, but obviously it is what he thought. So he thought of himself, and, and he has good textual arguments for that, and he knew his Aristotle very well. Of course, you know, I don't know how uh, how far you, you went in, into reading Aristotle. It's very difficult to see exactly what position he has on universals, for example, um, or basically on anything, but uh, it, it's not impossible, but you know, it's yeah. kind, of, kind of a job. But, but well, Ockham thought of himself as an Aristotelian, except on a few points where he thought that uh, it contradicted Christian faith. For example, about uh, the, the, the uh, future contingents having no true value. And uh, this is something that Aristotle develops in the uh, treatise on interpretation. And uh, uh, Ockham but that from a, a Christian point of view, this cannot be right because God knows what will happen. So uh, future contentions do have true value. So mm -hmm. this is a, one place where Aristotle was mistaken, uh, but his, his philosophical argument were not bad. So he had you know some good reasons to go this way, uh, but they were not absolutely conclusive. And we Christian, he often says, know better because of a revelation. Uh, now, with respect to uh, his contemporaries or, or other medieval philosophers, the, the, the uh, dominant position with respect to universals in the 13th century, no, not the period, basically the century before Occam, uh, was what we call now moderate realism. That is um, the position that there are no separate universals, as uh, they Plato had thought, or as they thought that Plato had thought. Uh, but uh, there are common natures within the, as parts of, intrinsic parts of uh, the individual being. So in this view, there we all have in common a common human nature that is part of you and part of me and part of every uh, human being. So this is what we usually call moderate realism. And um, uh, Occam rejected that, and that he didn't care to argue much against a Platonic, Platonist position because he thought that well, Aristotle has already refuted that kind of position. Uh, but uh, he argued in great length against what we call now moderate uh, realism, especially uh, against uh, Scotus. Uh, he thought, and and I think he, he was basically right about that that. Scotus developed this, this doctrine of moderate realism in a much more precise and elaborate way than, for example, uh, Aquinas. Uh, I think the, the, 
the really great, and that's what Ogden thought too, the really great representative of moderate realism is, is, is Scotus, who's, uh, you know, nicknamed the, the subtle philosopher for, uh, the subtle doctor, excuse me, for very good reason. He's very subtle. He's, he's and, and Ogden had a great deal of respect. You know, Scotus was Franciscan, same as Ockham, Ockham was a Franciscan friar. And uh, when Ockham was a student, uh, Scotus what was the, the star, uh, was becoming the great star among, among Franciscans. There was a rivalry between Franciscans and Dominicans, and Dominicans had already had you know, their great star. It was Aquinas, who died uh, in 1274, some, some decades ago. Uh, and the, 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 the Franciscans were looking for uh, a theory to to oppose to Aquinas, and Scotus was the the, the best candidate. And mm. uh, so, Ockham, when he was a student, uh, studied the work of Scotus very precisely. Maybe he met him at some point, um, but he find he found himself in disagreement with with Scotus. Uh, but he thought his arguments are not bad. He's not. He's not. He's a very good philosopher. So we have to discuss that very precisely. So much of his discussions on universal, on relations and uh, quantities, uh, are discussions with uh, with Don Scotus. Right. Yeah. So that's helpful because I mean, as you explain in the book, it's like when we talk about the problem of universals, it seems like if you were going to use the terminology of the medievals. It, it would be more precise to say that what they disagreed about was the extramental existence of common natures. Yeah. Because like you were saying, if you take universals as something predicable of many, well, actually Aquinas, Scotus, everyone agreed that that depends right. on predication and thus depends on um, the mind. But when it comes to common natures like humanity, that's where the that's where the disagreement was and and um, um, but I see that Ryan uh, do you, Ryan do you have a question did you want to jump in yes thank you I'm sorry can you hear me by, by the way yeah we can yeah okay great um so what I want to ask is it sounds as though the fundamental fissure that is announced by Occam and the movement that's called nominalism is a fissure between the way in which predicates can, um, can refer only to the order of signs, or can they also refer to the order of real things? And in doing so, can um, are, is the order of signs related back to the order of real things? And it occurs to me that, for, and, and I would think that also for a student of Aristotle, they would find that that the possibility of predication is only true in as far as, or you must say predication is only true in as far as it names the properties of things. And for Aristotle, ultimately, there is a kind of substantial inherence of the way in which we speak of something and the way that something is. Uh, and he affirms this in a very radical way. So it sounds like something changes in William of Ockham after, um, after Duns Scotus, and that this, this sort of creates this severance between signification and reality that, as Indian Jill Son and others will later narrate, has ramifications in modern idealism carrying on into the present day. And we can even see, for instance, um, Modern French philosophy, for instance, Gilles Deleuze as recapitulating this, this severance of the sign from reality. So what I wonder is, why would anyone, I mean, it seems like a crazy thing to say that, that signs are sort of not appearing in things and that there's truth to signification that doesn't, doesn't refer to the real in which it inheres. Um, and also, why didn't often his contemporaries or successors see that this was a potential problem, that we can talk about signs, though they they they, they here within a, a kind of simulated order, but that, that, that simulated order doesn't have any subsistent ground. Yes, I'm not sure I got everything because I, I uh, did not hear very well, but I think I got the uh, the basic idea of the question. Sorry. I'm having trouble hearing you. Could you, can everyone speak up just a bit? Yes, uh, I, I said I am not sure I heard everything all right in your question because of maybe technical problems. Uh, but I think I got the, the main point. So, um, that's better. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes. So, uh, I, I think I got the main point. You correct me if I, if, if I'm besides the question, uh, 
as I said before, for Occam, uh, general predicative sentence uh, can be true about the world. So there's no uh, such cut between language and uh, the world. His point is that we have to understand precisely what the connection is. We are uh, in a position to say two things with general terms about the world. Why is that? Well, as I said before, because things really resemble each other. Uh, there is a term that Hockham does not use, but that I think is useful here, is the term of co-specificity. So uh, all horses, for example, in Occam's view, really are co-specific with uh, one another. Uh, so if I say Bucephalus is a horse and I say Trigger is a horse, uh, that is absolutely true. Both are true. And why, why are they ever, why, how can it be true of two separate individuals uh, that they both are horses? Uh, it's, you know, they, they, uh, what Hagam says is that they maximally, they are maximally similar to each other. Uh, the Latin term is similimus. That is uh, what I, I use uh, the term co-specificity for. They are really co-specific. This means that they're, uh, basically it means that their causal powers are equivalent. Uh, in, in similar situations, whether uh, you have one or the other, the kind of effects that they will if, uh, produce on other individuals uh, or the kind of individual that they could uh, bring about to the existence of would be pretty similar to, to one another. Um, the main point for Occam is that the tooth of general sentences, even universal sentences, like all human beings are animals or all human beings are mortal, the tooth of such sentences does not require uh, the uh, acceptance in the ontology of special general property. Uh, the existence of singular does the job. And then, of course, you have to explain how it is that uh, our signs can uh, be adequate. So here's where, where the semantic theory comes in. So the whole se Occam's, the whole of Occam's semantic theory uh, aims at explaining how it is that we can say true general things, true relational things, uh, excuse me, true general sentences, relational sentences, quantitative sentences about the world, even though there are no general entity, no relational entity, and no uh, additional quantities, quantitative entity. Uh, so that's basically the, the, the picture. In the, in, the, in the case of relations, um, what is central to Occam's view, and this is a point I did not insist on in what I said before, is that, as I said, there are no relations in, in the world itself. But nevertheless, things, the individual non-relational things, are really related with one another. So relational sentences can be true of the world. It is true, for example, that um, if, if A is, stands beside of B, it is true that A stands beside of, of B. Uh, but this is not because, Occam says, this is not because there is a small thing, parwa res, a, a small thing in between A and B, or in A and in B, uh, is just because they're ordered in this way. And 
uh, that that's enough uh, for that to be true, that we have these singers so related. So that's the, the general uh, the general picture. I don't know if it's uh, and it really replies to the question you the way you were uh, uh, expressing. Does it? Yeah. yeah. Great. Thanks for the question, Ron. Yeah, and and hopefully you know later we can get into more detail into the semantic theory because yeah, that's it's not as though. Well, yeah, it, it, the, the these general terms they do have a significance. They still do signify. It's not as though they lack signification. It's just that what they signify is singular and singular objects and properties. But um, uh, yeah. So, Michael, do you want to uh, jump in? Yeah, sure. Um, thanks. I I'm not super familiar with um, Occam and. You know, I haven't read the book or anything. I'm just uh, coming to this from, you know, heard about it from the Dionysius Circle here. But I, I am interested in an Occam because I'm a Plato scholar. And so I I mainly work on like the sophists of Plato's late dialogues and the five tides. And and so I, I kind of always wonder what would Occam say to, you know, so yeah, like late Plato or something like that. Um, and I figured you might have some thoughts on this. So so yeah, it, in in Plato's dialogue, the Sophist, we get the forms, you know, that are called the greatest forms are um, being, same, different, motion, and rest. And so it seems like Occam is kind of, as as you're presenting it, he's saying, well, these things really resemble one another, or they're really the same, or at least similar to one another. Sure. And so, um, yeah, why? I guess how is that not just the same thing as saying? there's a form of resemblance that all these things share in, right? Or there's a nature of resemblance if we don't want to use the word form, right? Whatever word we want to use, what in the end is, is really the difference there? Saying like, yeah, resemblance is a thing that's in the world um, or similarity or, or whatever we want to call it. So yeah, I wondered kind of what his response would be to that sort of objection. Yes, the, the, uh, the basic question for Occam is what is the basic furniture furniture of the world. So what things uh, are we uh, countenancing? Should we countenance uh, in, in the world? And he thought that if we uh, try to countenance, uh, so let's say re relations or universals as additional things, uh, we run into a, a completely misleading picture of the world and and um, and in vain difficulties that we can avoid by you know not accepting these these as extra things. Uh, for example, let, uh, there are a lot of arguments there, and I think we will come to these arguments later. But uh, let's say about relations. If um, re relations are extra things in addition to relata, then these extra things. He had you know the Bradley regress argument. Uh, already is in is in Occam is well these extra things they should be related to uh, the the substances and qualities so we need extra relations in between the substance and the first order relations so to say and and if we posit these new relations as extra as additional entities as well uh, then we need to say, well, these additional entities are also related with the substance with the previous relations that we had. And, and then we get uh, sort of an um, endless multiplication. And uh, Adam thought, uh, first, we will have an infinity of things. And he was a finitist, as, as Aristotle was. And we shouldn't have such an infinity. Uh, but also, this is completely useless uh, because if, if something is acknowledged is countenance as being a thing in, in Occam's world, uh, then we are allowed to refer to it. Uh, we are allowed to say this, uh, or, or uh, we uh, and we have to account for the signification, the meaning of all our terms and the two conditions of all our 
sentences or true sentences at least uh, by referring to real things. So if we can do that uh, without uh, having to refer to relations as extra entities, then we don't we simply don't need them. We don't need all these complications and all these additional difficulties we run into if we if we accept them. Uh, he thought that situation was even worse concerning universals because then he thought that he said this is the worst error in philosophy accepting universals. It leads to contradiction and it leads to a completely wrong picture of, of what the world is. Uh, so if we can account for the truth of general sentences without having to say that we refer to these universals, no, just having to say that we refer to singular beings, then we're in business, that then everything is okay. And this is what, what is semantics, is has a very developed semantics. This is what the goal of the aim of semantics is. Um, maybe I can, I can say at this point that uh, there are, you know, basically, there are, a number of semantic tools that he uses for this. Uh, basically, signification of a term is understood as uh, what we call today plural reference. So the signification of a term like horse, what is it? Well, it's nothing but it, the, the, the referring of the term horse to all the horses simultaneously. So instead of being a one-one relation, signification is a one-many. A term refers simultaneously to several individuals in the world. Another uh, very useful semantic tool for him is the notion of connotation. Because uh, one could say, well, uh, if signification is plural reference, and it's only that, uh, then what about this is Frege problem? And uh, what about terms that are coextensive but not synonyms, you know, like morning star and evening star and Frege, uh, or um, Renat and Cordet and Quine? And how come how come explains that with his connotation? He said a, a large number of terms are connotative terms. This means that they have not only a primary signification that is referring to uh, several things simultaneously, but they also have a secondary signification, which he calls connotation. Uh, take um, a term like father. Father, the term father refers to all the individuals in the world who are fathers, uh, but it connotes uh, the children. You know, it, it brings to mind the children, but indirectly, Occam says obliquely. And the term father applies to a certain individual insofar as this individual is related in a certain way with other individuals, namely the children. Uh, so this idea of connotation uh, explains why there certain terms can apply, extensively apply to very same individuals, but nevertheless not be synonymous with each other, uh, with one another, because they have different connotations. They, they obliquely refer to uh, something else. But what they obliquely refer to are only individuals as well. Yeah, so if I could follow up on this, because I guess what if, and I, yeah, I take it at least some readings of Aristotle go in this way. And, you know, I mean, again, like you mentioned, Occam thought of himself as basically an orthodox Aristotelian. So I, I kind of want to see if this is the way that he was going. Um, where you could say, okay, fine. Things like relations, resemblance, or they're not things, for, but, but those uh, human nature or whatever, not a thing. Um, but it is a nature that individual humans have. Now it's not a thing like somehow separate from them or or whatever, but is there like, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I'm, doesn't it have to be the case or if it doesn't have to be the case, then how does, what, if we're really human, what is it, what, what does that mean? Like, what is it that makes us really human? Is it certain qualities that we have? Is it certain 
nature, again, not a nature that exists as like a separate entity, but just, yeah, we actually have the quality or, or nature of being human. Um, or we have the quality of being one, you know, oneness and, and resembling and, and not, again, not to reify those as if they're like individual things in the world, but they're rather properties or qualities of things. I mean, is does he accept that? Uh, he wouldn't say we have the quality of, because quality is a technical term in his vocabulary. It refers to accidental, accidents of, of substances, such as the color or the weight. So those are things that we have, and they're real things. You know, I, I have a certain color, and uh, but I don't have a human nature. I am a human being. Uh, this is something about what uh, Socrates or Plato is, not about what Socrates or Plato has. Uh, of course, we can formulate things this way. There are, you know, a lot of equivalent way, but the, the strictest way of formulating it is saying Socrates is human, Plato is human. Applying the same term to these two, uh, brings about the idea that they have equivalent, basically equivalent causal powers uh, in, in, in the world. Uh, but it is not to say that they ha really have something in common, that they really resemble each other, they resemble each other, uh, one another in, in, their, in their causal powers. Uh, so those are basic facts about, about, uh, about the world. And uh, well, Platonists are sometimes worried that, uh, yeah, but shouldn't we account for these basic facts? Uh, Alchemist's point is that whatever your philosophical position is, you'll need basic facts at one point. You know, if you accept uh, ideal forms, for example, or separate forms, you have to say that these are separate forms. Uh, and what is it that they have in common to be separate forms? Uh, they, do they have some formality? Well, one point you have to say, well, this is just how things are and not uh, uh, how they are in virtue of being connected with something else. Uh, so at one point, there are things that there, there are, uh, it, let, let me try to be precise. Uh, one point you have to say that things are what they are just by themselves in virtue of what they are and not in virtue of being connected with something else. And this is what happens with uh, the basic natural kind terms, uh, such as human being. Occam calls them uh, absolute terms, such as, you know, uh, human being, horse, or, or generic terms such as animal. Um, we're human beings, we're animals, and this is just uh, of course, he would he, he, he does account for a certain complex um, metaphysical complexity, especially in human beings or animals. Uh, he is a, a um, tenant of the is a tenant of, of the thesis of the plurality of substantial forms. Occam followed Aristotle in uh, accepting hylomorphism. No, substances, substances have qualities, and qualities are different things. They're, they're dependent upon substances, but they're different things. On the other hand, material substances uh, are complex objects. They have parts, essential parts. Essential parts in, in the sense that if, if one of these is, was not there, the thing is destroyed. Uh, and these essential parts Occam thinks of uh, in the framework of Aristotle's hylomorphism. So for material substances, there is a matter, uh, a chunk of matter, say. And this is a real thing, natural thing for Occam, contrary to what Aquinas thought. And uh, typically you have a substantial form. So a material substance is uh, uh, the union of a chunk of matter and a singular substantial form. The substantial form is, is a singular being itself. Uh, it's, not, it's not something general that gets individualized by 
uh, uniting with a matter. It's individual by itself. But in the case of animals, and especially in the case of human beings, uh, Occam thought that uh, these beings have several substantial forms, contrary to, say, uh, Aquinas, who thought that uh, every, sub sub every material substance has one substantial form. So uh, Occam thought that for certain beings, there are several substantial forms, uh, but each of these is, so for human beings, for example, have an intellectual uh, substantial form, which accounts for the fact that they can think, reason, and so on, and will, and but they have also a, a different substantial form, which is a sensitive substantial form uh, that accounts for the fact that uh, it can uh, perceive uh, by senses, and they have a corporeal substantial forms, which are, that accounts for the, the the structure of their of their uh, biological organism. And he has arguments for saying we should distinguish between uh, these in in human beings and in animals uh, as well. So uh, he has a more complex uh, view of what these substances are than just saying well they are what they are. So so the basic this brings us to the idea that at bottom the basic components are the the mat the matter and the substantial forms and the qualities so that's what the uh, Occam's ontology is is built on okay yeah if I, if I can real quick follow up um yeah because I think I'm I just want to make sure that I'm understanding here so so the idea is is I can say I am the substantial form human being you are the substantial uh, form. No, 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 no. Or would that, is that not like a no, true thing? No, not that? exactly. Okay, uh, yeah. How would you uh, say I, it? I, uh, you would accept that I have a substantial form uh, of intellectuality, and I have a substantial form of sensitivity, and I have a sense of substantial form of corporeity in the sense that these are essential parts of myself. So I am not identical with any of these uh, substantial forms. So I am not a substantial form. I am a, I, insofar as I designates the, 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 the whole substance, am a composite of matter and a number, a limited number actually, of substantial forms. But it, I am not identical with any of these, except that there's a complication here uh, linked with uh, the survival, uh, what uh, do I survive when my my body, you know, before the resurrection of, of bodies? Uh, so Occam has arguments about that, and but basically it comes down to this: that uh, he says, well, there is a sense in which we can use I or human person, uh, according to which it would designate the principal part. Of the subs of the substance, so mm -hmm. there are contexts in which uh, we would uh, we would identify the human person with its principal part. And in the case of human beings, the principal part is the intellect, uh, because it's the intellect that allows us that makes us meritorious uh, or or meritorious. That's why it is the and the mm -hmm. and it is the, the part that survives. So that's why it's, it is the principal part. So in these contexts. Uh, we can say that I am my intellect, uh, but in you know, in natural situation, ordinary situation, uh, I am not identical with any of my essential part, but with the the composite uh, of these of these parts and matter. Okay, then one one more quick thing because I think I'm starting to sort of see how this fits together. Then, um, so and then he would also allow it to be true to say that you and I have the same substantial forms. No. Uh, <laughs> no okay, so... You you have well, your own substantial forms. I see, I have, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And I have mine, but these substantial forms yeah. essentially resemble each other. So your intellectual substantial yeah. form essentially resembles one of my substantial forms. Uh, your uh, corporeal substantial form essentially resembles one of my uh, substantial forms and and uh, and so on. But we don't have the same substantial forms. Substantial forms are singular, and we all have our own. 
and and then <laughs> and then the resemblance is something that is a basic fact that we don't yes it's not for. something and so or, the yeah, right it's not something, but it's a basic yeah, the right way to, to right way to put things is that uh we resemble or our substantial form we resemble each other but not to say that the resemblance how come insists that uh, this nominalization is, you know, very useful in in ordinary talk because it allows us to, it allows for brevity and elegance. Uh, but we should be suspicious of nominalization, especially with abstract terms. So he has a lot of 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 things to say about abstract terms, like um, you know, animality or humanity or uh, freedom or whiteness. So just uh, some of them are, are uh, innocuous, like whiteness, yes, there are whitenesses in the world, each of them is singular. Uh, but uh, there's no, when we use an abstract term, we tend to think that there is one abstract object corresponding to the abstract term. And this is uh, the illusion uh, that we should uh, care about, be concerned with. Right. Yeah, thank you very much. This yeah. definitely helps me have a better sense of Occam than I've ever had. Right. Yeah, thanks for those questions, uh, Michael. Yeah, the issue of essential resemblance is like, I think, is a really key one when it comes to yes. maybe the disagreement between yes. platonic and, um, and hopefully we can kind of circle back to that later too, when if hopefully we can get to some semantics, because some of the semantic theory, because that essential resemblance is going to play a key role in understanding the semantics of uh, general terms as well. But maybe now we can kind of shift to uh, Occam's arguments for uh, nominalism with respect to universals. Um, and basically, I mean, you provide four arguments. Uh, Excuse me, uh, Sam. Yeah. Uh, before getting there, you, you yeah, have yeah. Uh, uh, a question about beauty. Uh, in, oh sure, in, yeah, yeah. You, you, I, you sent me, and uh, you, you sent me a, quot a quotation, a nice quotation by uh, I don't remember. Eric Pearl. Know. Okay. Yes. Do, um, do you want me? I could screen share the quote. Do you want me to do that, and we can look at it, or? Yes. Yes. Okay. Please. Yeah. Okay, we can do that. Uh, okay. I don't want to comment on all of it, but only sure. Okay. Part um, of it, because it, it will nicely illustrates exactly what we were saying okay that which is in bold okay if i point to a certain things and say of it this is beautiful this could not be a true statement about the thing itself unless that thing and all other things of which this statement is true do in fact have beauty as a common look so as you on have understood by now this is something that uh, occam would would you know squarely reject uh and but uh, it goes into very deep questions. Uh, Occam does not have much to say about beauty. Uh, he, he has no aesthetics that I know of, and I have not worked myself uh, in into uh, aesthetics much. But uh, reading this, I thought about you know personal experience. So if I may share uh, an anecdotic personal experience, I, I uh, love to do some. Frequently, I do uh, horse riding, uh, and I don't own a horse myself, but I uh, regularly ride. There are a couple of horses that I regularly uh, ride, and one of them, his name is Sirius, like the, like the star, you know, Sirius. And uh, almost every time I ride this horse, and I go along the trail and uh, meet with people walking in the, on the trail, Someone uh, in, the, in the walking group would say, "Oh, this horse is beautiful. Uh, what a beautiful animal!" Or something like that. And, and I, I, I do share this judgment. Seriously, mm -hmm. just a beautiful horse. Uh, now, what is going on? Uh, well, for one thing, uh, the people who say that they express a certain feeling, a certain emotion you know, wow emotion that they have in, in seeing this horse. Uh, not any wow emotion, but uh, an aesthetic kind of wow emotion. So that's the subjective aspect of it. Uh, 
is it the uh, all there is to it? Uh, well, some would think yes, the beauty is subjective thing. Uh, it, contrary to what the, the quote says a little further, this this would not make the world uh, a, a dull place. Uh, you know. Yeah, where does it say that? Um, something if uh, it, so basically he says if, like if we reject beauty not, itself, the yeah, common, then it, nothing actually has beauty as a feature of itself. This yeah, just, leaves us indeed with a very dull gray world. Yeah. Yes. Uh, this is not a consequence of the subjectivist view because uh, the world is still such that it brings about these kind of emotions in in people, even if it brings different emotions in different people, uh, it's still a very exciting place to be uh, because it does bring these emotions. But nevertheless, uh, I, I'm pretty sure that uh, Alcom would have been an objectivist with respect to, to beauty. So uh, if we turn to what in the horse itself uh, grounds this uh, judgment, makes it true that this is a beautiful horse, uh, well, saying that it is because it has beauty in it, think of it, it doesn't explain anything. You know, it's, it, it's exactly uh, what Molière uh, called a virtus dormitiva uh, explanation. You know, this is in, the, in his play, uh, The Imaginary Invalid, Maladie Imaginaire, uh, Moliere has a group of doctors trying to explain why I think opium uh, uh, brings about sleepiness in people, and you know very seriously in in a very scholarly way, uh, their conclusion is that well it is because it has a virtus dormitiva in it that it brings sleep. Virtus dormitiva just mean a uh, you know. Um, a virtue of bringing uh, sleepiness, bringing about sleepiness, so bringing about uh, bringing sleepiness about virtue doesn't say more than that. Uh, the the uh, I looked at the Wikipedia article on on virtus dormitiva, and it has a nice formulation there. Let me quote it: uh, a virtus dormitiva explanation is a type of tautology in which an item is explained in terms of the item itself, only put in different, usually more abstract words, by explaining why it is beautiful in terms of it has beauty. It's an abstract term, but actually, uh, you know, it's just repeating the same thing in slightly different things that look, in slightly different words that look more deep because of the abstract term. Actually, uh, what we should say, I guess, is, horse is beautiful in virtue of how its parts are related uh, with uh, uh, with one another with, with one another uh, how with in virtue of its color uh, of how it moves and all of this uh, Occam would say uh, is accountable by you know singular features of the horse itself and we don't need to add another thing, an additional thing, which is the beauty in the horse itself. Occam would have, doesn't discuss this particular case, but he certainly would have an argument of, this, of the following sort. Um, let's suppose that beauty is really in the horse as a distinct thing, as a distinct reality. Then God, who is omnipotent, all-powerful, could take this thing out, could destroy this particular thing, beauty, in the horse. Uh, what's left? Well, the parts of the horse are organized in the very same way than before. Uh, its color has not changed. It's, it moves in exactly the same way as before. Uh, so it still is beautiful. You know, people who I would cross with while riding service would still say it's beautiful. Uh, so the point is that we don't 
uh, turning to beauty as an abstract object that accounts for the, be the beautifulness of, of, the, of the horse explains nothing and uh, it, it raises difficulties that we don't need. So uh, I just, you know, thanks for the, for the quotation, just, you know, made me remember these horse rides. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah, no, I appreciate you commenting on um, that passage. Um, because yeah, like it, it really it helps us appreciate the distinction between obviously this platonic and this more anomalist uh, perspective, and and what you hinted at there too, um, the, the issue of you know given God's omnipotence, He would be able to remove this property. That's kind of hinting at this crucial principle in Occam, which you call the separability principle, which yeah. will come up as very important in his refutation um, or his attempted refutation of uh, realism. So maybe we can, um, I think that's a good segue into his, uh, into the four arguments you present in your book. Um, it's in chapter two, it comes, uh, yeah, it chap it's in chapter two of your book where you go over um, the Occam's various arguments against realism, and it's really a rich, um, fascinating chapter. And so maybe we can look at the first, the first argument that you provide. Um, and you call this argument the argument uh, from numerical unity. And as I understand it, I just just to set it up, the argument, you know, it seems like there's at least two forms of realism about universals, and. One would say that terms like horse or animal refer to intrinsically general beings that are in no way singular. And then another version, I guess, would say that a term like horse or animal refers to a, a kind of very special kind of singular being. Uh, and that's more like platonic, because in some sense, the, the platonic form is a singular being but it has a special property of uh, being participated in. And as you presented that, so this first argument, the argument from numerical unity, it's actually attacking that first kind of realism, the idea that um, these general terms refer to intrinsically general beings. And so could, yeah, could you just walk us through that argument? Why for Occam can it not be the case that um, there are, these intrinsically general beings, which are referred to by um, terms like horse or animal. Uh, well, I, I can, of course, going into the argument in detail uh, would be a bit complicated, but I can I present yeah, it sure. very, very, in a very simple way. Uh, the point is this. Okay, suppose that there are universal things that are distinct from uh, singular beings. Um, what Arm wants to show is that you will end up having only singular beings anyway. Because mm -hmm. you, you, you take a singular being A and uh, a universal uh, F, say. And in on the thesis that those are two distinct entities, Arkham say, Arkham says, then you have a on the one hand and F. However, they are that they are related. Maybe F is in A or it's outside A. We don't right. care at this point there. But if so, Wagam says, we have two things there. We can count them. You know, A is one and F is another one. So that makes, you know, two, two things. And if you have two things, each of one is each one of them is a single thing. And that's what it is to be a singular being. It's to be a single thing, to be counted as one. Numerical, this is the argument from numerical unity, because the point here is that numerical unity is exactly the distinguishing feature of singularity. So you end up having singular beings anyway. Right. Of course, you might have, you might say, well, okay, but, but some of them, the F of special features, special capacities, properties, and so on. Uh, but the point of this particular argument is that you'll have, they're countable. If they're distinct, they're countable. If they're countable, they're, they're numerically distinct, numerical 
each one is a numerical unity. Right. That's the point of this particular argument. Right. So it moves from, it's like you, you get them to admit that they're different, that this general being is different from some singular being. Once they admit that difference, then they're going to have to admit countability, that you can count one and the other. But then once you admit countability, it looks like you land with a singular being on both sides. Okay. So, okay. right. And so, and, and like I mentioned that, so that argument, um, it doesn't attack, and, and as you as you explain in the book, it doesn't really attack a platonic form of realism. So now the second argument you pre present, um, which you call the argument from separability, this is an argument that does um, take aim at a more platonic kind of realism. And so, um, and so as you, as you say in the book, you know, the, the, the idea of the platonic kind of realism is that universals are singular beings, but there are special kinds of singular beings and that the things in our world get their properties by participating uh, in them. And so, um, and so, yeah, could we, could we kind of just, Canvas, you know, obviously, like you said, it's, it's complicated, but maybe um, we can talk a little about that argument. Also talk about this important principle of ontological separability. Yes, the principle here, Ockham's principle, is that uh, if two things are really distinct from one another, then uh, God could make it that one of them exists and not the other one. Okay, so there in said said in in uh, more mundane terms, then there is a possible world uh, where one of them exists and not the other one. So if, this is a sense of the um, uh, you know the strength of of individuality that uh, if you have two individual two two distinct entities. Uh, there is a, some possibility, maybe not a natural possibility. Maybe that would not be possible in the natural world, but at least uh, from the point of view of God's omnipotence or what you know contemporary metaphysicians call metaphysical possibility. There is a metaphysically possible world where one of these entities exists. And so that provides us, once this principle is accepted and of course, for Occam, it had a theological ground. You know, it's really grounded in uh, God's omnipotence. So once this principle is accepted, it provides a test uh, for uh, deciding whether we have two entities or, or not in a certain situation. If uh, we end up with something that is not separable, then this must be the same in any metaphysically possible world, then we have only one entity there and not uh, and, and not two. So okay, then now suppose that we have a platonic platonic uh, universal form of uh, humanity, and you have a human being. Let's leave everything else aside. Uh, as I said before, Occam was not concerned really with arguing against Plato. He thought. Uh, Aristotle had already done that. But in this case, we can, uh, for ourselves, coin a, a variation of Occam's argument that does apply here. Uh, if those are different, really distinct entities, then one of them, God could make it that, let's say, this, the ideal form is suppressed and the individual human being keeps existing. And if it keeps existing, it is still a human being because being a human being is essential to a human being. It's not like being uh, white or being uh, uh, or, or uh, walking. Or, those are not accidental property. It's essential to, to a human being that he is a human being. So if he still exists, he still is a human being. And then the conclusion is that uh, there's absolutely no need to bother with these uh, uh, um, external forms. Uh, you know, we still have uh, human beings without them anyway. Right, so I mean, so it seems like what it's, would you say that one way of putting it is that it's attacking the idea that 
um, because it seems like a, pl a platonic um, a Platonist would want to say that we know there are forms or there must be forms because otherwise the entities in our world um, would not have any determinacy. They wouldn't have any determinate properties. And this is showing that, well, you know, if they're distinct entities, then it's actually possible for God to create a world where, um, you know, there aren't platonic forms. And if that's possible, then it's actually possible for entities to have, to be human beings, for example, without these platonic forms. And, and, and thus, determinacy, having determinate properties is actually possible, uh, sans these platonic forms. So it seems like, as I understand, it's kind of, it, would you agree that it's, it's, it's attacking this idea that a platonic form is necessary for something to have determinate properties? Um, yes, I think the, the basic intuition here, I think, and I think, as far as I understand Aristotle's, it was also Aristotle's basic intuition here, is how could what a thing essentially is depend on how it is connected with something else? Because for something to be connected with something else, it has to be itself in the first place, and so, so to say. It has uh, to be so, to have some determinacy, and, and then, not then in a chronological sense, but then in a metaphysical sense, it can be connected with something else. But how can uh, being connected in a certain way with something else account for what the thing is? So, it, so basically, that's the uh, that's the, the intuition here. I think. Gotcha. Great. Um, did it, uh, Michael Carson, anyone have a follow up on on this particular argument? Uh, Ryan, yeah, please. One question and then one follow up. So my question is: Did Occam have access to Proclus's elements, and did he did he read Proclus's critique of Aristotle? And then my second question is, um, if he did, would he have distinguished the, the singular uh, referent of a sentence from, um, for instance, the, the singular uh, singular predication of a universal from what Proclus characterizes the hinads, that is the one likeness of, of which everything participates? And if so, um, how could he as how could he then um, render, well, it, it, if not, then he seems to have been ignorant of, of Proclus, and if so, um, how can he how can he reduce the the relation of participation in Proclus to the Hinads to a merely semantic or predicative relation? Well, there. Uh, th thank thank you for uh, for this question. Again, I'm not sure I, I understood. I, I uh, heard everything right, but uh, the important what it may it it gives me the occasion to make an important point. There are no bare particulars in in Occam's ontology. Now, so there are no property-less uh, uh, individual. Uh, in the view of bare particulars, uh, such as defended by Gustav Bergman, for example, the metaphysician, the Austrian metaphysician, Gustav Bergman, uh, all the properties even the essential properties are sort of super added on a bare substratum, which in itself has no property. It's property-less. Uh, but this is not so in Occam. Uh, on the one hand, we have the qualities. Those are you know, real properties. They're distinct, as I said. But on the other hand, they're properties of substances, and substances are in of a certain type by themselves. So they're not, substances are not propertyless. Even matter, you know, as I said before, uh, material substances are uh, complex beings uh, with substantial forms and a chunk of pure matter. But even pure matter for Occam is not a, a, a bare particular is not a property less. It's 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 matter. It's extended by itself. 
it's ex space, it's extended space. Being extended space is not something, that's something Occam repeats again and again. Being extended in space is not something that is super added to a substratum. It, you know, the substratum by itself is extended in space. It, it's not, and he has a lot of arguments against, this is arguments against the existence of quantities as distinct. Uh, so uh, no bare particulars in, in Occam's ontology, no property lists, in the sense that uh, everything is determined as, as is determinate in some way or other. Carson, did you want to uh, ask a question? Thanks for that question, Ryan, by the way. Well, I just sent something in the chat. Um, you want to read it, uh, Carson? Oh, OK. Well, I was just thinking about this principle that you uh, brought up, Dr. Pinaccio. Um, if two things are really distinct, God could make it that only one of them exists. Right. Um, and if they're not, if these two things are not separable from another, they're the same. Right. And that, that's... Oh, oh, excuse me, just one, one precision. Okay. They're either the same or one of them is a part of the other. Oh, okay. An essential, okay. An essential part of the other. So that's, yes, that's a, an okay. important precision. And, yeah. Okay. That might change things. So I was wondering how that might relate to Christology insofar as uh, human and divine nature are fully distinct in principle, according to the Chalcedonian definition. Uh, yet it doesn't seem like um, they're um, yes. separable in a way, but they're not, they're not reduced to the same thing either. Um, I, I wonder just how, how Occam would understand the fully distinct aspect of the two natures in Christ, that they're two fully distinct as natures, yes. and then they're united as in a concrete identity of hypostasis. Yes. The, uh, I, must, I must admit the properly theological questions in Occam, such as Trinity and Christology, I have not studied very deeply. Uh, but nevertheless, the case of Christology is interesting because he raises it uh, in in uh, very early in the uh, Summa Logicae, the sum of logic, uh, when he discusses the relations between concrete and abstract terms, and he discusses the relation between human being, homo in Latin, and humanity. So humanity is the abstract term, and uh, human being is the concrete, the corresponding concrete term. And he says, well, in some cases, concrete and abstract term must be understood as synonyms. That is, none of the two refer to a, something real that the other does not refer to. And he says, uh, if we leave Christology aside, this is the case with the humanity and human being. So in, you know, in rather contrived way of speaking, uh, we could say that Socrates is a humanity, not that he has a humanity, but he is a humanity. Uh, humanity is just, you know, an abstract way, a contrived way of saying that he is a human. But then we have the case of Christ, and and because of the case of Christ, uh, there is something special about human nature. Uh, Christ does have ha is not his human nature. He has a human nature. And so there is uh, a distinct entity there uh, that, that is a distinct. Uh, so how it is organized in, in Christ, uh, exactly, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to say. It's a complete you know, theological uh, matter. But there, what I want to point out is that because of the case of Christ, the case of human nature is different. But it is not different in human beings, just it is different in Christ. Mm. So maybe I don't know how satisfactory this is as theological position, but that's, that's what it is. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. 
Great. Thanks for the question, Carson. Um, maybe we, now we could just, uh, I guess this might be the most complicated argument against realism, but this is the fourth argument, skipping over the third. This is the fourth argument against uh, that really challenges SCOTUS's version of realism. Um, so maybe, I guess maybe the first thing to do then would maybe, could you kind of give us a sense of like, how SCOTUS's version of realism um, is distinctive. I mean, it seems like the, there's these two key concepts of formal difference and then uh, individual difference, I believe. Um, but yeah, so could you, just to set up this fourth argument, could you maybe? Yes, as I said at the beginning, I think uh, Occam thinks that uh, the, the best representative of moderate realism uh, in his time was was uh, Scotus, and uh, in very short and you know great yeah. summary, uh, Scotus' idea was that okay, we should reject the idea that there is a real distinction in let's say a horse between the uh, horses of the horse and the uh, individual horse itself or whatever is individual in 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 the horse there is no real distinction there and by rejecting real distinction there he uh can accept all the other arguments that Occam gave against accepting a real distinction okay Occam is right about uh, he didn't say that because you know Occam wrote after but right. you, you could say uh, okay, Occam is right about rejecting these uh, these separate things that as really distinct from mm. the singer. But nevertheless, uh, he thought that we could not account for science without accepting common natures somehow. And so his point is that uh, common natures are real. They're real. Uh, but they're not really distinct from the singularizing part of an individual. So any singular being uh, that is a, of a certain nature, and that is the case for every singular being uh, all across the, the world, uh, in every such singular being, there are intrinsically two metaphysical components. There is a common nature and there is an individualizing factor, which he calls uh, the individual difference. So, you know, it has been called also akshayte. Uh, it takes Socrates, Socrates is a human being. So Scotus' idea is that in Socrates, there is a common nature of humanity, uh, and there is Socrates, and what Socrates does is that it singularizes the common nature. So the common nature never really exists by itself as a common nature, but it, it always exists as singularized by an individual difference or an exchange such as Socrates or Plato AT or, or so on. But uh, Scotus was aware that if we say that there's a real difference, a real distinction there between the common nature and the, 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 the individual difference, then this could not be made to work. So he said, no, there's no real difference there. There's a formal distinction. Uh, and what is characteristic of the formal distinctions is that you have two mind independently existing realities, but they're not separable from one another, even you know, by God's power. They, they, they can't be separated. They, they, they go along uh, with one another. So once the common nature is singularized in, in Socrates by Socrates, then you cannot, you know, cut out Socrates from the common nature. They, they just go along 
Uh, so there is this formal distinction there. So uh, Occam addresses this notion and the, 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 the central target of his argument is the idea of formal distinction, as, as you might expect. Right. Uh, he thinks that this is, you know, uh, an ad hoc invention uh, that is, has catastrophic consequency for rationality. And uh, his, his argument, uh, I, I called it the argument from the uh, uh, indiscernibility of identicals. He doesn't use this label. Uh, this usually a, the principle is usually ascribed to Leibniz, but Occam has it as was very clear about, about it. The principle is that if two things, if A and let's not say two things because they're not, if A and B are identical or A is identical with B, whatever is true of A is true of B, since they're identical, right? Uh, okay, but now take Scotus ontology uh, and you have it that um, the individual difference is an individual difference. That's tautology. Uh, but the common nature is not an individual difference. If it was an individual, an individual difference, you you would not have this duality. You know? So uh, the common nature is not an individual difference. The individual difference is an individual difference. So something is true of the individual difference that is not true uh, of the uh, something is true of the individual difference that is not true of the common nature. So they are not identical. And I would say, if A and B are not identical, then they must be really distinct. Of course, you know, Scotia would say, well, that's what I'm trying to avoid. Because I want to say that they're not quite identical, but nevertheless, they're not really distinct. But Adam's point is that, and he's very explicit about that, showing that two things are not identical, that A and B are not identical, is the only rational way we have of showing a real distinction. That's you know one of our main rational tools. This is how we show that there is a real distinction. It's how we go about. This is what you know uh, rationality about real distinction is. So if we reject the inference from not being identical to being really distinct, we're, we're uh, uh, leaving aside one of our main rational uh, tools uh, for the sole reason that we want to save the common nature. And we can do without the common nature anyway. We can account for everything without renouncing this very important uh, rational principle. So that's basically uh, uh, Ockham's argument there. Great. So, yeah, I mean, when it comes to, yeah, the SCOTUS response, like, you know, obviously he's going to have to accept, or it seems to me like he's going to have to accept the point that, you know, there's something true of the common nature, which is not true of, or sorry, there's something true of the individual difference, which is not true of the common nature. Namely, the individual difference is identical to itself, the, or identical to the individual difference, whereas the real common nature is not identical to the individual difference. And, but like you said, what then Occam, what he wants to do there is say, well, that's our best criterion, or that's the only criterion maybe we have for establishing a real difference. And so it seems like, yeah, like you said, he's going to have to somehow disagree with, um, you know, that method of establishing a real difference. And the only thing I was thinking, I mean, I don't, I don't know if, you know, what your experience is in terms of like scotistic responses to this argument, but like, I mean, one thought I had was, would they try to say that if you accept this criterion for real distinction, um, then we're going to overgenerate really distinct beings. So for example, you know, maybe the SCOTUS would say, well, if we accept that criterion, then the persons of the Trinity end up being really distinct 
beings, or maybe they would say, you know, the mercy of God ends up being really distinct from his justice, and thus God is no longer simple. So I'm just kind of curious. I mean, yeah, one, you know, just in your in your your sense, what's like the general scotistic response to this? And then it, it, does it take that form that, you know, we're going to overgenerate <laughs> really distinct beings, basically? Uh, I, I'm not sure that scotists would go this way, but whether they would or not, the question is, uh, is very interesting. Uh, once more, once again, I, I, I think I'll leave aside the Trinity question. Uh, okay. uh, I, I think uh, Akmod doesn't make a real distinction between persons. Okay, maybe that's uh, actually but, uh, uh, but but yeah, the the uh, other kind of of uh, overgeneration that you uh, pointed at uh, are very interesting to look at, especially you mentioned the case of uh, you know. God's justice and God's benevolence, uh, for example, uh, one day uh, turn out to be different things. Actually, uh, this is precisely one sort of reason that was given in favor of nominalism uh, instead of against it by defenders of nominalism. I'm, I'm thinking of, uh, you, you know, in, in, in the late 15th century, around 1473, uh, there was, you know, big discussions and, and even quarreling between nominalists and realists of various uh, types, Albertus and Thomas and Scotus. Uh, and and uh, at one point, you know, uh, the king of France, Louis XI, uh, uh, made a decree uh, that uh, banned the teaching of nominalism mm -hmm. uh, from all universities in France. And he, he named a number of nominalist masters. William of Ockham was the first one, then Burden and a number of other ones. Who, who you could not, if you were a, a university teacher, you could not teach uh, those, those authors in particular. And then a group of nominalists uh, uh, replied to the king. Uh, this is the document known as the defense of nominalism. And they said, well, let's be clear what, what nominalism is. And the main feature they give of what nominalism is, their view, is that a nominalist is someone who refuses to multiply entities according to the multiplicity of names. Uh, an example he gives is that if you if you do multiply entities with multiplicity of names, as the realist typically does, uh, you'll end up having God's justice as something distinct from God's benevolence, because you have a word for this. Uh, I, I, I gathered as, as, as a Dionysius circle, you addressed it in the question of divine names. So that's the, the, the core of the, of the discussion here. Uh, you have several non-synonymous divine names for describing God. Uh, and if you multiply things according to multiplicity of, of names, then you'll have distinct properties in God and God will lose the simplicity that he's supposed to have. So mm -hmm. this was very briefly brought as an argument for nominalism. And of course, it is an argument for nominalism only if you have some semantic way of distinguishing between terms that are that apply to the same thing but that are not synonymous. And that is what connotation was. And in this particular theological context, this is not innovation uh, uh, by Occam. Actually, it. Uh, the 12th century theology, maybe before, but especially uh, 12th century theology developed uh, this idea that uh, several non-synonymous terms can apply to a sim single simple entity, such as God, uh, while not being synonymous, because they have connotation. They obliquely refer to something else. You know, benevolence refer to how the, the uh, individuals in the world are treated by God and justice also refers to another way that 
these mm. individuals are treated, uh, but they do not refer to an intrinsic difference uh, in, in God itself. Uh, but then this raises uh, subtle issues about predication. Uh, because if an alchemist comes back very often to these sort of cases, if you take two non-synonymous term applying to the same individual, uh, then if they apply to the same individual and you have uh, uh, what we call to the transparent context, uh, then any true sen any sentence and with one of them as a subject has the same truth value than any sentence that has the other term as its subject. So let's let's take uh, Socrates and uh, uh, Diotimus's husband. Socrates was Diotimus's husband. And uh, so Socrates is an absolute term. It designates Socrates, not else. It has no connotation. Uh, the phrase Diotimus, uh, Diotimus, uh, husband uh, has connotation. It, it obliquely refers to uh, Socrates' wife and to that the fact that they were married and so on. Uh, nevertheless, if they're both identical, if, if Socrates is really uh, Diotimus' husband, whatever is true of Diotimus' husband is true of Socrates. Mm. So uh, you won't, the, the, the test of uh, the uh, indiscernibility of identicals will not uh, turn out to reveal two entities there. It's all, it's, since they're the same, everything is true. And sometimes it gives some uh, strange uh, uh, sounding uh, consequence, but Akam always insists that if you're, if you're in a direct uh, transfer, he does not use this vocabulary, but transfer in context, then uh, only the reference accounts for the truth value, whatever the connotation is. Great. Well, thank you for that. I mean, it, it really fascinating issues related to yeah establishing real difference among entities. It's um, really fascinating, and uh, and we're you know we're we're kind of nearing the end here, um, just about ten minutes, and so maybe we could just. With the last question, uh, we can kind of circle back a little bit to something Ryan brought up about, you know, are we not, you know, by rejecting universals, are we kind of not um, uh, rejecting the signification of kind of natural kind terms? And so to kind of answer that, can we just, just one question on, you know, on the semantics um, of natural kind terms you say that, you know, basically the meaning of a natural kind term is going to end up being reduced to its extension. Okay. And it's, you know, so for example, horse is going to refer to um, all the singular horses. And um, it's not going to refer to the set of all singular horses you explain. So so yeah, it could maybe, and then and then of course, and then you say that essential similarity or resemblance, something we've talked about earlier, that plays a key role here. So could you kind of just give us, yeah, with this last question, maybe just an introduction a little bit to um, this key issue of the the, the semantics. Um, yes, well, natural kind terms. Uh, from purely semantic point of view, you just said it. Uh, Occam, as I said before, Occam distinguishes absolute term and connotative terms. Uh, what we call today natural kind terms is what he calls absolute terms. So okay. those have only one semantic dimension. It is their extension. So they, uh, the term horse does not say anything about horses. Of course, we might have associate uh, beliefs, associate ideas uh, in, our, in our individual minds concerning horses, depending on the experience we have of, of horses. But the term itself has no descriptive content whatsoever. It just, its meaning it's entirely reduced to its extension. It means it signifies uh, horses. That's, and, and nothing, uh, and it signifies them equally. No horse is, no horse is more horse than any other. So everyone is, is on a single uh, level. 
Well, that's the semantic and connotative connotative terms, but they have a connotation in addition. I, I talked about that a bit. So that is semantic. Of course, now it might raise uh, a, a problem. So how can we uh, learn such terms? I mean, we cannot go you know, through each single horse and say, well, okay, this one would be a significant of the term horse, this one too, this one too, and this one too, and then go to, because there's, uh, Occam says, uh, a term like horse signifies all possible horse, not, not only all past horse, all future horses, or real actual horse, but also all possible horses. Uh, and we cannot, and there are an infinity of, of such possible horse, so we cannot go you know, one by one. So there must be something that uh, makes the term horse projectable, so to say, you know, applicable to, uh, and this is linked to something we have not talked about at all so far, uh, namely uh, Occam's uh, gnosiology, Occam's epistemology, philosophy of mind. Uh, linguistic terms for Occam get their signification by being subordinated to mental concepts. So the, the basic thing is mental concept here. Mental concepts are signs. So thought is a form of mental language in, in Occam, the language of thought, in pretty much Jerry Fodor's sense. Uh, what we think in no particular language, such as you know, French or English, but uh, we thought is nevertheless organized as a language. Uh, we can make predicative propositions. We have uh, prepositions, uh, adverbs in, in pure thought, and, and so on. So now the question of the learnability of a general term comes down to the question of how can a general uh, natural kind concept be acquired? And uh, this is something Agma has several things to say. He's, he does not develop a very explicit theory about it, but we can gather what his theory would be. And it goes in, in cannot develop detail, obviously, but it goes in the following line. It, he says that if you meet with one horse, single for the first time, let's say, uh, let's say, take a chickadee, first time in your life, you, you see a chickadee, you see it well, uh, you see it moves, uh, so on, then you naturally, there's no decision in your part, no, no volitional activity, you naturally form a general representation that will apply to all chickadees. That is, th there's no magic here. You just you know, form a mental label that applies to this individual that caused it and to all the other individuals in the world that are co-specific, that are you know, maximally similar uh, with it. And that is a very useful uh, device. We can think you know, of... Uh, I don't know, a sheep who uh, meets with a wolf and uh, he, he, the, the sheep really feels in danger, but uh, finally uh, flees uh, away from the wolf. But then he has a representation, the, the, the sheep has a representation that would apply to all the other animals that are such as this one. So he forms a general representation. So in the case of human, it's uh, uh, the general, the generality of the representation is a uh, uh, principled, so to say. So it applies not to particular external form or so on, but to every individual that is really uh, essentially similar to this one that uh, that I have met. So every formation of a general concept is based on on. Empirical, empirical meeting for Occam, which he calls intuitive encounters, intuitive cognition. To form the general concept of a sheep, we have the simple general concept of a sheep, we have to meet with a sheep, uh, we have to see one. Otherwise, we have a description, complex description. We can have that with something else. Uh, and, and every time we meet with an individual of a new sort, we form a general representation which in principle applies or has in its extension all the individual that are maximally similar to this one. That's that's how the mind is made, how the human mind is made. 
Fantastic. Well, I just, you know, we're about our end here. So I'd really like to convey my sincere gratitude for you coming on. Um, it's been a really uh, fantastic discussion, very thought provoking. And uh, I, you know, obviously I recommend everyone, you know, purchase. It's an excellent book, uh, Occam's Nominalism. And so thank you so much, Claude, for uh, coming on. Well, thank you. <laughs> very exciting discussion. Absolutely. So, all right. So long. And thank you all to, for joining as well and asking questions. It's been great.